My name is Barbara Kern, and I'm the director of the Science Library, and it's such a pleasure to welcome all of you to the University of Chicago and to the John Carrar Library. So welcome. We're so glad you're here with us today. Um, today we are here, of course, for the Kathleen Azar Symposium. This is a symposium series that's named in honor of Kathleen Zarr, who's the former director of the Science Libraries. And it's held every two years with our first one in 2009 that was entitled Small Scale, High Impact Renovations, Redesigning Library Spaces on a Budget. Since that time, we've had a variety of different topics. We've talked about collecting data. We've talked about assessment. We've talked about instruction. And today, we're talking about the very important topic of open data. We have great speakers. Um, we're so glad that they're all here with us today. And we have a few breaks throughout the day and, of course, lunch for networking opportunities for all of you to get a chance to talk with one another. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank those who make this symposium possible. Howard Zarr, the Carrar Foundation, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine Greater Midwest Region Office, the organizing committee who you will meet throughout the day and I'll have them introduce themselves to you as we go along through the day, and our, uh, the support of our university librarian, Brenda Johnson. So with that, um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. I'm looking forward to it. I'm gonna turn it over to the chair of the organizing committee, Deb Warner. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to re reiterate the welcome that Barb just gave you, and thank you all for coming and attending. Uh, I'm just going to give you some of the logistics for the day. So um, all the talks will take place in this room. So we'll have three morning speakers, the first two followed by a break, and then we'll have our final speaker. And then we will have lunch over at the Regenstein Library, which is our main um, campus library, Humanities Social Sciences Library, um, which is about a block away. And there are plenty of you Chicago people in this room right now, so we'll all go over, to a get, all go over together, and uh, uh, the University of Chicago people can lead the way and show you how to get there. Um, and then we'll have uh, additional speakers after lunch again back in this room. Um, there is a schedule, a printed schedule. If you didn't see it, it's out on the front where the name badges are, as well as in the back by the coffee. And then on the reverse is information on how to get wireless access if you need that. So that's available to you. Uh, we also have a nice little visitor guide and map. So if uh, the weather holds, we have a really nice morning right now, and you want to wander around uh, campus, we have some maps for you again in the back and out front. Um, and the restrooms are where you walked in, what we call the atrium, with the big um, skylight, so beyond the glass wall, and then by the staircase at the end. That's where you'll find the restrooms. Uh, we do have a Twitter hashtag, so hashtag czar2017. So if you um, are a tweeter, <laughs> please tweet about this meeting. And um, after each speaker, there will also be time for questions and answers. So um, keep that in mind. And with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. So Stephanie Wright is from Mozilla. Stephanie leads the Mozilla Science Lab, a program of the Mozilla Foundation founded by the Sloan Foundation and the Helmsley Charitable Trust and the Siegel Family Endowment. Her work at Mozilla focuses on hosting events such as working open workshops and open leadership trainings, developing educational resources such as the Open Data Training Program, and building a community of leaders through Mozilla, Mozilla fellowships and other activities. Prior to Mozilla, Stephanie worked for the University of Washington where she developed and led the library's Research Data Services Unit, served as a senior data science fellow at the UW's eSciences Institute, and co-authored the Librarian Outreach Kit as part of the Community Engagement and Outreach Working Group for Data One. So as you heard in the introduction, I work for Mozilla. And I've become used to the fact that when I'm introduced to a new group of people who are interested in open data, I will frequently hear, hey, you work for Mozilla. You've got great developers. What can they do to help us build tools that'll solve our open data problems? Yes. We do have a lot of great developers. I won't question that. However, I don't believe that our open data problems can be solved with a primarily technological solution. Um, and as a former data librarian, I, as much as I believe in and support 
data management <coughs> methods and instruction. I also don't think that that's going to be our primary solution either. So in short, our issues around open data aren't a programming problem. They're not a management problem. I think they are largely more a people and community problem. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't some data issues that can be made a whole lot simpler with new technology. Uh, workflow tools that capture metadata of data sets more easily, that'd be awesome. Uh, simpler solutions for archiving and discovering data. Perhaps more cloud data analysis solutions that don't require downloading large data sets to get the information that you want from them. There's also something to be said for uh, better identification of data management best practices, um, improved training and curriculum around data management. And there are examples of these things already out there. But before those issues around open data can be fully addressed, we really need to address the need of developing the culture around open. So technology and data management techniques are really merely tools for people. And unless we develop a community of people who believe in open data and want to learn and use those processes and tools, they aren't going to do us any good. Now, this might sound a little strange to you coming from someone who um, works for what is commonly identified as a tech company. And just to give a little more credence to what I'm saying, it might help if I explain that the tech company that many people um, identify as Mozilla that makes Firefox uh, is actually owned by the nonprofit Mozilla Foundation. And the Mozilla Foundation is actually who I work for. And the Science Lab is one of the programs in the foundation. And what the work that we do really focuses a lot on people. So through experimenting with and assessing various community building events and activities, we've learned a great deal about what brings folks into the openness fold. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, keeps them engaged and keeps them there in that fold. Oops, forgot that part. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a little peek behind the curtain of Mozilla. Um, in late 2015, early 2016, we partnered with a consulting firm called Network Impacts. And we asked them to evaluate our network and the communities within it. They focused on three of the programs within the network, one of which is the Mozilla Science Lab. Another one is called uh, Mozilla Clubs. And then there's another one called Hive New York. And we provided participation data from a series of events that we'd held. Um, they also did surveys of these communities, um, asking who they collaborated with, what they did, that sort of thing. And with this data, they were able to create this map for us. Now, this map shows you, over on the left, we have the Science Lab community in green. The purple dots are Mozilla Clubs, and the orange dots are our Hive New York folks. Those blue dots are the people that are cross-pollinators across those groups. And if you look at this, you see we have three very distinct communities, but we aren't really one big cohesive community, which is what we need in order to change the culture globally. What we learned from this is that we're very good at building our internal network. We're less good about creating that global change and that global community that we're looking for. So how do you build a broader community around open data? First, context. We learned this was very important. You need to be aware of, understand, and be open to the context that others are living in. We all know intellectually that everyone lives different lives. But how often do we think about that in terms of the support that we provide for open data? So let me give you an example. Uh, this amazing woman on the right is Christy Balai. Christy is an insect ecologist at Michigan State University, and she is, was one of the science fellows who's in our first cohort. 
as part of her fellowship project, she developed a course called Open Science and Reproducible Research. And this was designed for graduate students. She was actually able to test it and teach it during her fellowship at Michigan State. This course now has a different name, and there's an interesting story around that, but that's a, for a different time. Talk to me about it over coffee. Um, Christy told us a story about how she was mentoring one of her students um, for, on her thesis. And this student was from a developing country, and she was at Michigan State on a visa. The student was looking for advice on where to publish her research, and she suggested a number of journals to Christy. And Christy asked her, are you going to be able to access these journals when you go back home? I will give you all three guesses what the response was, and the first two don't count, right? Um, no big surprise. Then Christy asked her, well, what tools are you using to analyze your data and um, actually create your publication? Again, no big surprise, she was using very expensive proprietary software, which she wasn't going to be able to use when she went back home. So thanks to this conversation around context, Christy was able to help this student, uh, number one, get her research published in PLOS One, so she could access it when she got home and her colleagues at home could access it. And number two, she worked with the student to learn how to use R to do her data analysis. So again, she'd be able to use those tools when she left the United States. Along with context, I'm going to call out how we communicate with others. Um, many of us have a habit of creating our own vocabulary to meet our specific needs without taking into consideration how it walls and blocks out others who aren't hip to the lingo. Um, I remember it well in academia, throughout the libraries. Um, how long has there been a debate about what to call the reference desk, right? Um, even within Mozilla, we have this problem. The good news is we're aware of it. <laughs> when we onboard new employees, we've developed this Moz Lingo Bingo card in an attempt to make newcomers feel comfortable asking for clarification when we've used a term before that hasn't been explained. All right, here's the audience participation part. How many of you have used GitHub? Okay. How many of those who have used GitHub understand the difference between forking, branching, and cloning? Uh, a couple of hands, okay, a couple of hands. All right. Now, here's the trick question, ready? How many of you can clearly explain those differences to someone else <laughs> using only the top 10 hundred words in the English language? Okay. Um, so if you're interested in trying that, I invite you to try this uh, de text editor. It's a tool that we use in our jargon busting exercises in our working open workshop. It only lets you use the top 10 hundred words, and I'm saying 10 hundred instead of 1,000 because 1,000 is not in the top 10 hundred words. And what I would challenge you all to do is try to explain open data only using the top 10 hundred words. And here's a clue to the challenge. Data and information are not in the top 10 hundred words. Second lesson we've learned is that building community isn't a one-off affair. It requires continued investment. That's only fair since we're asking for continued investment from our community members to open data as well. As part of that continued investment, it's helpful to show folks a path, the next steps to maintain their engagement. Last year in Berlin, we introduced a program that we call Working Open Workshops, or WOW for short. So if I say wow, it's not because I'm excited, it's because it's too long to say working open workshops. And during this two-day event, we work with participants through very minimal lecture, lots of collaborative hands-on work to learn how to more openly and collaboratively, work more openly and collaboratively by identifying personas, articulating pathways for contributors, developing project documentation, and learning how to make their data reusable. Um, also planning out a roadmap for their project. We do several different size wows. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we held one that we call a mini wow in Portland that was only a day and an evening. 
Uh, today, in fact, in London, a couple of our science fellows are holding an even shorter version they're calling a micro-wow, uh, which is only a partial day. Full-size wows are two full days, and we use them as kickoff events that are aligned with our open leadership training program. So prospective participants in the open leadership training program submit applications with projects they want to work on and get moving over the next few months. And some number of those are accepted into our open leadership training program. This is a 12-week mentorship where Mozilla staff, former mentorship participants who are now mentors, meet virtually with their mentees one-on-one -on, -one on a weekly or bi-weekly basis to identify and provide support for concrete steps to keep their projects moving. The mentorship culminates in our annual global sprint or MozFest, both of which I will explain, where participants are given an opportunity to present their projects. So global sprint, here's my jargon, global sprint. Our global sprint is a hybrid online and in-person hackathon, let's say, uh, that we've been running out of the Mozilla Science Lab for the last three years. And how it works is for 48 consecutive hours rolling across time zones, we start in New Zealand, we end in Alaska, uh, people come together virtually and physically to work on collaborative projects. There are people in our community with projects who volunteer them for collaboration during the sprint. Projects can be anything from an open source program, it can be curriculum development, it can be planning for an event. And then there are site hosts all over the world, and this is the map of our site hosts from last year, who offer up space, Wi-Fi, sometimes coffee, um, for these people from nine to five over in their time zones over the, what actually ends up being 53 hours uh, time of the event. Participants from all over the world are welcome to join in at these sites, or remotely if they want to stay in their pajamas, uh, they pick a project or two or three that were submitted to work on and they jump in, anything that interests them. Uh, last year, we put our open data training curriculum into Google Docs and we submitted that and it was the most amazing <laughs> experience because I woke up and went to our host site in Seattle at 9 a.m. and by that time, a group of 30 people in Tunisia had been working on our project for almost eight hours. Um, so we overlapped for a little period of time. I got to chat with them. They told me what they did, what their thoughts were. So for the next eight hours, I worked on it, incorporated their ideas. I went to bed the next morning, woke up. Tunisia had been working on it again. <laughs> so we kept working on it. Um, and by the end of the two days, we had some really great ideas and had taken some things that were just going to be primers and we'd expanded them to also include instructor guides so that um, librarians, educators could take this material in a box, basically, and, and teach people how to um, do open data. This year, the sprint will be held June 1st and 2nd. I'm putting a plug in here. Uh, we've been working with other programs in the foundation to make this an organization-wide event, so it's not just Mozilla Science Lab. Um, We've been also in discussions with folks in Australia who have been leading the Research Bazaar. Has anybody heard of the Research Bazaar? Oh, a couple of you, okay, good. And, and we're thinking about how we can combine these two events into one huge global in-person and online event. Projects that are worked on in the global sprint um, can make so much progress, excuse me, that they are then submitted and used at, uh, presented at MozFest. MozFest is short for Mozilla Festival, and it's our annual summit, you might call it. We invite people from all over the world to present demos, lead hackathons, pursue development of projects over a three-day event where we transform a London design college, which you can see in the picture on the left, nine stories, and each floor has a different theme. So in the past, we've had different floors for different programs at the foundation, such as a youth floor, an advocacy floor, a journalism floor, of course, a science floor, um, just to name a few. 
planning for this year's MozFest is actually taking place right now in Thailand, Estonia. And the rumor is that the plan for this year's MozFest, we're actually going to switch up the representation on the floors so that they represent one of the core needs of internet health as we've identified in our internet health report. So open innovation, decentralization, um, privacy and security, web literacy, and digital inclusion. So rather than having the floor separated by programs so that you only have people within those programs mixing among each other on the floor, we're creating floors with issues so you have people across programs that are working on those issues, working together and presenting together. So through this process, we have community members who have started with an idea for a project around open science, open data. They've learned and practiced how to work openly during the workshop, the working open workshop. They received three months of mentoring to stay invested in it and make progress. And then they're given an opportunity to present this to, and share it with the world. OK, finally, I'm going to encourage us all to really think outside your own box. And when, I'm, when I say this, I'm not thinking of the usual, think outside the box, think big. I'm talking about, think about your box that you're living in. And I guess this gets a little bit back to that context idea I was talking about. Look for opportunities across new and existing communities to bring people together to engage with each other. When I say communities, I'm not just talking about working across disciplines, which is something that we've been talking about for a long time in the libraries, um, although I think it would be really great to get um, some fine arts folks and computer science folks together to come up with some amazing data visualization techniques, but again, another talk. Um, but I'm also talking about across organizational, geographical, and professional communities. That last one was a real eye-opener for me when I left academia and went to work for Mozilla. Um, sort of an embarrassing story, but I'm going to share it all with you anyway. Uh, my first day, I sat down with my former boss, Caitlin Thaney, who used to lead the science lab. And we were brainstorming on who we should be reaching out to as we built our new open data training program. I offered up a data librarian I was friends with at AUS University a researcher that I knew in Australia, a data scientist I knew in the UK, and I was feeling pretty proud of myself because I had this global connection network going on. And Caitlin sat there, she went, uh-huh, okay. All right, well, so here's the name and contact info for the chief data scientist at the White House. Here's the name and email address of the head of research at Wikimedia, and you should also probably talk to the former vice president for science at Creative Commons. Oh, <laughs> got it, okay. That's when the light bulb went off. So some of our more recent co uh, collaborations have been with these organizations. We're working with Penn Libraries and their Data Refuge Project and the Association for Research Libraries to host an upcoming meeting in May in DC uh, around the Libraries Plus Network where we'll be talking about um, how our communities can come together to identify how to preserve federally funded open access data that might be in danger of going away. We partnered with the Wikimedia Foundation and several other like-minded organizations around the initiative for open citations. We've also added one of the co-founders of the open access button to our advisory group. We've been eating our own fox food, uh, so to speak and being more intentional about how we work across the groups within our organization as well. So recently we partnered with our advocacy team to run an advocacy campaign around open science and open data. We kicked it off on Open Data Day in March with an online petition asking people to support open access to federally funded research, which garnered over 14,000 signatures on the first day. We followed that up with a Reddit request for March for Science slogans, from which we selected our top 12, and we created March for Science signs for the recent March for Science. We also launched our 2017 call for science fellows, and we're ending our campaign this week by hosting a Space Apps Challenge site in our Brooklyn office. And through all these things, we kept circling back to the iHeartOpenData.org online petition. So again, it was 
creating resources, making them available, and providing a pathway for people to continue to stay engaged. So what basis do I have to say that this stuff works, right? Um, some of the stuff I've talked about here has been really new, um, and we're still figuring out what the impacts are. But in late 2016, we began interviewing our community members and collecting their stories in a portal that we call Story Engine. And here's some stories that we've collected so far, just bits and pieces. These are all available on our Story Engine website. I've provided the links on the slides so you can go read more if you like. I highly encourage you to do it. They're inspirational, they're fascinating, they're wonderful. This particular quote is from Achintia Rao. Achintia works for CERN in Switzerland with the Large Hadron Collider and on their open data portal. Uh, here, Achintia was telling us about some data that he had access to. And while it was interesting, it wasn't really getting used to its maximum potential. And he then decided to take this data set and make it part of a global sprint project. And this is what came out of that. Here we have Egley. Egley works for the Human Computation Institute at Cornell. And here she's talking about her experience at MozFest. Egley moved among the different floors at MozFest and met a whole lot of folks with whom to collaborate that she wouldn't have interacted with otherwise. And out of this came a crowdsourcing project called crowd to map Stuart Lynn, head of research and data at Carto. He's also talking about his experience at MozFest. And finally, we have Brian Bott from Sage BioNetworks in Seattle. And he's talking about the Working Open workshop and how it changed the way he worked. These activities and assessments took place over the last year and some change. So I can't really give you long-term impact information. But we've been able to identify a change in thinking and mindset of these people through activities that took place over a relatively short period of time. We're really talking about the last year and a half or so. And I realized that my examples were mostly Mozilla examples. And this isn't a, hey, ain't Mozilla great talk. Um, I provide them as, as inspiration, hopefully, to think about how you can build community around your own activities and make pathways and plans for people to change the culture around open data. I want to share what we've learned about changing the culture so far. And this is somewhat a long preamble to an invitation. I really want to work with you all. Uh, Mozilla wants to work with you all. Our community wants to work with you all. I recently read this quote from Cisco's 2015 security report. Yes, I am that nerdy that I read Cisco's security report. People, processes, and technology together must form the defense against today's threats. So they're talking about security here. But based off what we've seen and heard from our experiences of the last couple of years, I'm going to appropriate this with a slight modification. People, processes, and technology together must form the bridge toward tomorrow's open data solutions. And I'm more than happy to talk more concretely with all of you about how we can build community together. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stephanie. So this is the time um, for you all to ask questions. So I'll bring the mic around, and you can speak into the mic. We are filming this. We want to make sure we get your question. I can start it off, as people are <laughs> thinking. Um, you, so you talked a lot about building community, and you have here an audience of uh, many people who are interested in open data. What is um, one concrete step that people can take back to their institution to kind of start down this road of building community around open data? It's a really tricky question, right? Because every community, you know, thinking about context, and I know that everybody's institution and context is going to be different. Um, I, I guess one thing that you could do first off is go back and look at the communities around you that you maybe haven't engaged with and think really creatively about using new tools that maybe you haven't used before. Like we used the, we did an online petition. It's really easy to do that. We reached out to Reddit um, to create slogans for the March for Science. So think really differently about how you engage with other people. Okay. Thank you. Okay, here we go.
Uh, leave it to me to ask the awkward question. Um, in today's political climate, what concerns do you have with open data? That it's going to disappear. That's my primary concern. Um, I have to be very careful here because we are a nonprofit organization, so there are constraints on what I can and can't say. Um, but yes, I'm worried about policy changes that will take away the open data resources that are available and really stunt, if not move us backwards, in terms of changing the culture around open data. With the, with the open projects, and like I was part of a data refuge event last weekend, which was interesting, and <laughs> it was interesting. Um, I hear you. <laughs> a lot of this tends to kind of coalesce around the, the idea of hackathons and, you know, those kind of things. And that's a very turning, that word turns a lot of people off because they are not coders or they don't see themselves as coders or expert coders. So how do we, um, like I'm looking at what you're talking about with these open projects and when you said the curriculum, I'm like, oh, I could work on a curriculum. And until you said that, my brain was like, yeah, this is a coding thing. I can't do that. <laughs> so can you, can you speak to that a bit? Yeah. That's where you go back to that text editor and really before you communicate and talk about these events, don't necessarily use the words that have been used in the past, but use your own words that will resonate with your community and more common words. Try to get the jargon out of it. I realize I used a lot of jargon. Um, I tried to explain most of it. But again, that goes back to so that goes back to the context and thinking creatively about interacting. So yeah, hackathons, it's a word that's been appropriated by a certain community. The activities involved with that hackathon, though, can be used across multiple communities, particularly if you don't frame it in that term that's already been appropriated. So come up with a different word for it. Say, hey, we're going to, I don't know if sprint would work or if we're going to have a dedicated work challenge where we work on these projects or collaborative scholarship event, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's really, I think, the key there is the communication. Does that answer your question, Abigail? Okay. I want to follow up on the question about um, access as we approach the dark ages. So, um, which makes me, I'd like you to differentiate between infrastructure that can now host open data and maybe infrastructure that will be resistant to suppression? Do we have good sources out there where we can put information now that's less likely to be suppressed? So I would love to be able to answer that question for you succinctly, um, but that's really kind of the purpose behind the Libraries Plus network meeting that we're hosting with ARL and uh, Penn Libraries in May. That's exactly the question we're gonna be asking. How can we do this? How can we make sure that these um, copies of these data sets aren't being relied to be in just, you know, it kind of, some of it, ugh. I don't want to prescribe what's going to happen at this meeting. Part of me is thinking, oh, you know, lots of copies keep stuff safe type of idea. Um, we've been working with Internet Archive on the data rescue events, so maybe that's an option, but that's one of the things that we're definitely going to be exploring at this meeting in May. have two questions but the first one really was a more technical one about language and in your global sprint do you have like a whole bunch of translators to make sure that the conversations more global <laughs> how so, do you do that so actually a lot of these projects come from all over the world so the projects are born in other languages um, do we spend time actually translating um, so say something that's in English do we translate it into Portuguese or um, Afrikaans, so it's understood in those other um, countries where those languages are spoken. We don't because this is really a volunteer and community-based event. It's really the community that's running it. We just kind of provide the administrative support. Um, but we have been working with um, a localization team that we have within Mozilla to try and 
make these materials that come out of it more accessible. So once the sprint is done and the project's in a more formally formalized state, I won't say finished because we don't believe anything's finished. You just keep working on it. Um, then we can work on localizing them to um, different areas of the world. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I was actually thinking the other way around, selfishly, of English and assuming some sort of standard language, but um, people on site presumably can take up that initiative. The, the other question, very, very quickly, um, you must be generating a mass of data from participation in this thing. Have you <laughs> been able to visualize and find stuff out? Any, any useful trends coming out of participation and the, and the way it spreads across the world? And so this is where we uh, bump bump a little bit against our own ethos, where we don't believe in collecting too much data about people. So we're very careful about what data we collect and keep. And we have re really only within the last six months starting being more systematic about implementing certain internal structures so that we can track people's progress um, through our different initiatives just to identify impact, not to do anything with those people, but to identify the impact of our programs and see what's working so that we can then take that information and present it to our funders and say, look, this works. Can we get funding to and focus more on this? Um, so the other thing that we did, I mentioned the network impact, where we did provide them with some data that we had collected over activities. They also did their own surveys. The science lab is also in the process of hiring another kind of uh, impact evaluation consultant to come in and look more specifically at just the science lab and all our activities and how we collect our data. So yes and no, <laughs> I guess. I mean, I wasn't just thinking in terms of you know sensitive places where people could get into trouble if they were tracked down participating yeah. in these conversations, but places where you know new new ideas somewhere in the middle of Africa or something that we hadn't you know realized that there was an interest or yeah those kinds of things. We have to be very careful in Africa and India and certain other places, and we we are very concerned about the safety of our volunteers. Um, and we have had some instances where we've had to step in and actually help someone get out. Um, so yeah, we were careful um, with that sort of thing. Um, we have recently um, set up an instance of the Open Science Framework at the University of Cincinnati. And I'm starting to think about how to promote it. Um, and I have maybe a long question that'll come back to this, but I'm, you know, we have to avoid mandates, the word mandate. I hope it's not in the top 10, 100. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not. <laughs> but um, so I'm thinking now about how, how to put money behind things and funding and are you, I didn't see government agencies in the network that you have there and I wondered about that and um, how, to, how to promote the tools we have without forcing people into it, you know, and putting money behind it or funding and things like that, so. I wholly understand that I'm in a unique position where I have private funders that are willing to throw money at me to do these sorts of things. Um, the, the, the good news is, is that those funders are probably also willing to throw money at you to do these sorts of things, just FYI, keep that in mind. Um, as far as government funding, um, we have not worked with them within the science lab, so I can't really speak too much to that. It's an area where we have a lot of growing interest, particularly since we've, in the last even three months, I've gotten several cities who've emailed me and said, hey, I want to turn us around into an open data providing uh, government department. How do I go about doing that? And that's an area that we are definitely going to be focusing on in the future. One thing I guess I didn't make clear is the Mozilla Science Lab is three people, including me. <laughs> um, so a lot of what we do is really volunteer based and what we can uh, find community members who are interested in helping us make these things happen. So I guess we provide a little bit of that financial support um, through Mozilla in some ways. We're not really a grant making institution so much, although we do give out micro grants for certain things occasionally. Um, but. Surprisingly, there is a lot, when you're talking about open data and building culture and community, there are actually quite a few places that are willing to provide services for free. Um, and 
fully take advantage of that. There's been a lot of times where some of these working open workshops that we've hosted, I've set aside this budget, like, oh, we're going to need at least this much. But then when we go out to do it, like we have venues that are like, oh, you're doing this? You work for a nonprofit? Sure, no problem. We'll give it to you for free. Uh, so totally take advantage of that. Um, and really do think about some of those funding organizations that maybe aren't the obvious ones for libraries. Like IMLS would be obvious, at least it was to me when I was a librarian. I never would have thought to go talk to the Leona Helmsley Charitable Trust, um, but they're interested, they're supporting um, much of our activities. In fact, they've fully supported our fellowship for the last two years. Um, so I guess that's my advice on funding. I'm not sure if that answered your question though. Kinda, we'll talk more. <laughs> All right, we'll have a follow-up about funding. Do they have specific grant programs that you're applying to, or are you approaching them um, individually, independently? It depends on the organization. There are, we submit when there are calls for proposals mm -hmm. um, that fall within our mission. Um, one of our current funder, funders, the Siegel Family Endowment, was actually, they don't take calls for proposals. Um, it was through networking and identifying their areas of interest that we were able to say, hey, we're doing this. Would you be interested in funding it? And they're going to be funding our fellowships for the next three years. So, yeah, go ahead. I have a follow-up question. And it's, it's kind of broad, but you can take it in whatever direction you want. Um, <laughs> I tend to do that anyway. Okay. <laughs> So um, from, from your perspective at the Mozilla Foundation, uh, what do you think that, that, that um, your role is or, or people in that field in impacting the culture of libraries? Obviously, you're having an impact today being here, but you know, library, the library culture and institutions and universities too, they, they change just as fast as a comet comes around sometimes. So. Um, uh, what, if you can just, just whatever your thoughts are on sure, that. Sure, sure. Actually, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I took over the science lab, leadership of the science lab, just in July of last year. And um, when I first started at Mozilla, I tried very hard not to say libraries, libraries, libraries for everything open data because I felt like we could solve everything. Um, but we might not be able to solve everything, but I do believe that libraries have a very significant role in changing culture, particularly around open science and open data, um, because I really believe and view libraries as kind of the linchpins in academia. We have a very high um, trust value. People trust us. We work across domains. We know a lot of the audience that Mozilla Science Lab is trying to reach and um, support. So I, my focus this year and really since late last year has really been reaching out to libraries and figuring out how we can work more closely together because I think our goals and our mission align very closely. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm right over here. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm hiding from you. Um, I'm trying to avoid in this question saying the phrase data librarian, so I'm going to say that right away. Okay. Um, piggybacking on the culture question, there's obviously a lot of open positions for data librarians. And I'm wondering if librarian is important. I mean, when we're looking, are we hiring, looking too much in the library world, when we're looking for data people for user services, um, how much of the library culture is important for them to know? And what would you look for in a position like that? We have two open positions, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and where are you? Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I don't have a good answer for that. It's one that we struggled with at the University of Washington as well. Um, I think that it's, there are a lot more soft skills needed. Well, I guess it depends on what, what, the, um, what the roles and responsibilities of the positions are when you say data librarian. And I, I've known data librarians who are, um, their focus is doing data consultations for researchers. I know some who are building repositories. I know some who are um, really digging in and working in labs with researchers. So it, it kind of depends, I guess, on what roles or responsibilities you're asking for. Um, 
I don't really feel comfortable going any further than that just because it is a, it is a good question and one that I don't think that I can adequately answer. Um, I think there are certain characteristics that people who are in library and information schools have that make them really good for this work. I don't know that many library schools are necessarily um, teaching those so in a direct fashion. Um, I think it really has a lot more to do with communication, networking, um, being able to talk with people in different contexts. I can say that I would not be able to do what I'm doing right now if I hadn't learned what I learned in library school about um, information theory and practice. Um, but again, it all depends on responsibilities that you have planned for that data librarian role. Okay, and one last question. I'm Chris. I'm also from the library, so that's my context for this question. Um, <laughs> Uh, often when we talk about open data or we hear about open data, we think about born digital mm -hmm. data. And uh, there are you know, movements afoot to think of library collections as a whole as data and not just um, one-off materials we sit and engage with singly and read word for word front to, to back. And um, certainly you're in a building that was part of the Google Digitization Books Project uh, uh, and, and so is the rest of the library. And I'm just wondering as you intersect with the library community or even actually outside of the library community, are, are you seeing specific needs for the libraries to begin to think of library collections as data? Um, for consumptive research and, 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 and other things. And, and maybe even just as we approach things like local digitization projects, how do we, how do we think about the, th the, the analog collections we're digitizing as potential future bits of open data and how do we get them out in a way that, that makes that um, effective for the communities that might need, need to think of them that way and, and use them that way. So I want to thank you for a quick, short question with an easy answer. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, you don't have the answer either. Okay. <laughs> um, wow, so many different ways to think about that. I, I think a key to that is actually the fact that we are now starting to think about our collections as data and broadening our perception of what data is. What that's going to mean for the services and resources that we need to provide in the future, wait and see. Um, be prepared to move when you figure it out. Um, I, really, I really don't know how to answer that question. Um, one thing I do want to say about that last part of being ready to move when we figure it out. Um, when I moved from academia into Mozilla, it was like going on a nice cruise to warp speed. Um, I think a lot of times in the libraries, and maybe this is just my experience, we tend to not make a movement until we're sure that something's perfect and ready to go. Mozilla, it's like, you have an idea? Sure, let's try it, see what happens. Granted, we have a lot more flexibility. We aren't taxpayer funded. We, um, we have, as long as our funders are happy with us trying things, we can get away with that. But I think one of the things that I do want to bring up in the Libraries Plus network meeting coming up is there are communities, and this is, again gets back to context, that don't work that way and they get things done. And if we're going to work together, we need to figure out what we can let go of in order to make something happen rather than trying to um, kind of do things the way we've always done them. I don't know if that gets to your question. I kind of went off on a tangent a little bit there, but I wanted to say that. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Stephanie.